Well, judging by the applause, I think that was an amen. amen. I told you last week that no matter what you're going through or what you've just come out of, no matter what you're struggling with or what you've gotten victory over, no matter what's waiting right around the corner for you in your life, the most important thing you can do, the main thing we all need to do, is keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is? Amen. That was the best I've ever heard. This morning I want to share with you a life-changing event in the life of the Apostle Peter that forever changed how he saw Jesus and himself. I want to tell you this story from the middle to the end and finish with the beginning. In other words, I'm going to start in the middle of this story, share the results of the life-changing event, and then go all the way back to the beginning and share how Jesus tried to prepare Peter for what he was about to go through, what was about to take place in his life. One of the things you're going to notice is that Peter's life, this life-changing event that he went through, affected his belief in who Jesus was and who Jesus said that Peter was. And many of our life-changing events has that very same impact on us. Things that happen in our lives can cause us to question whether or not Jesus really is who he says he is. 
I mean, when you're having to struggle through things, and you're up against it, and you know that God says, Lo, I will be with you always. There's times when you're walking along in life that you question that, right? I mean, when you're wondering, Lord, if you're always with me, then why do I feel so alone right now? Well, life-changing events has that kind of effect on us. But more often than anything, the effect it has on us is we begin to question, am I who he says I am? I want us to start by thinking about the worst moment in Peter's life. When Peter denies Jesus, and he doesn't just do it once, he denies him three times. Now when you look at Peter's highlight reel, the story of his life, you might think that it's impossible for this guy, of all guys, you might think it's impossible for him to do such a thing. I mean, this guy was selected as one of the 12 original disciples. That's a pretty big deal, wouldn't you say? I mean, of all the people, he was one of the twelve. He walked with Jesus, God himself on earth. He walked with him for three years. He was the only man, think about this, he was the only man besides Jesus who ever walked on water. At the instruction of Jesus, Peter pulled a coin out of a fish's mouth to pay his taxes. Peter did that. At the instruction of Jesus, Peter fed 5,000 men and their families with just five loaves of bread and two fish. Peter had seen and been a part of countless miracles. In fact, one of the writers of the Bible said that if he wrote down all the things that Jesus did, he wouldn't be able to capture it all. And Peter had a front row seat to all of that. He was at the Last Supper. Peter was in the room with Jesus the very last time he ever broke bread with people before he was crucified. Jesus himself told Peter that God was going to use him to build his church. And as a matter of fact, Peter gets a new name and a new identity by Jesus. Simon, if you remember, was his given name, and Jesus renamed him Peter. And at that, and that name and that identity came with it an amazing responsibility that over time would be a blessing to all mankind. Now listen, if that's not a highlight reel of somebody's life, I don't know what one would look like. But even after all of that experience, and now think about your life, all those experiences you've had with God, after all of those experiences that Peter had, all that time with Jesus, all of those moments that he encountered the glory of God, all that confidence in who Jesus was, and who Jesus said he was, Peter still messed up. And you'll see that when he messed up, he began to doubt that Jesus really was who he said he was, and that he was who Jesus said he was. One of Peter's strengths was his bold personality, and I think that's part of the reason why Jesus called Peter in the first place, because he was the kind of guy, as you can imagine, he was the kind of guy that would take charge. He was the kind of guy that would move quickly, that would act with passion. He would be the guy that would take things Jesus called to, to, to him to do, and he would do it without reservation. And you know, some of you in this church have that same kind of leadership ability. And I love having those people on my team. And no doubt, Jesus wanted this kind of personality on his team. The problem was, Peter never learned how to put a governor on his gift. In other words, he never knew how to dial it back or slow it down. He never learned how to guard his strength. And unguarded strength is a double weakness. In fact, nothing can get you into more trouble than your strengths. We've got, to we've got to learn to guard our strengths because Peter was unwilling to accept. He was just not in any way willing to accept the possibility of falling down. And because he wasn't willing to accept that possibility, he wasn't prepared 
or the opportunity to stand up when he could. When we can admit that we're prone to failure, that our strengths aren't strong enough to save us, we can find the power to live righteously through Christ. After the crucifixion and burial of Jesus, a few ladies go to the tomb, and most of you know this story. We read it and hear it every Easter. When they get to the tomb, they see that there is no longer a body there. And an angel says to the woman in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, Now go and tell his disciples. The angel wanted these ladies to run off and tell his disciples that Jesus is alive. He's not here. But I want you to pay attention to this. Go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. Now notice that the angel singled out Peter. I believe that it was because Jesus wanted the message to be crystal clear that Peter was still a part of his plan. You can almost feel the heart of God, of what God was trying to say through those two simple words, including Peter. It's as if he was shouting, Peter, I know you blew it. I know you messed up, but I am not done with you. I want you to meet me in Galilee, and if you're going to get there, you cannot stay where you are. So get on your feet, and in the grace, the power, and the love that I just died for you to have, get moving. Get back up. I believe somebody here this morning needs to hear this. God's telling you to get back up. He knows you fell. He says that the righteous fall seven times and they get back up. The righteous fall. Did you hear that? The righteous fall. That's the best of us, the cream of the crop. Those that are on the top shelf, we fall. But we get back up, and we stand in the righteousness of Jesus. And once you're standing in that righteousness, then get back to what I called you to do. Because I really am, Peter, believe it or not, all of you that have fallen, God's saying the same thing to you. I really am who I said I was. And you really are who I said you were. And you are who I've called you to be. And who I have called you to be hasn't changed. If you've made a mistake and you have repented, I've got some good news for you. You really are forgiven. So get up. And get after it. Scripture says that when the ladies came to tell the disciples that the tomb was empty, all the disciples stayed seated but Peter. Peter got up and he ran to the tomb to see it for himself. Two things happen here. First, Peter realizes that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. When he saw that empty tomb, he knew, wow! This guy really is who he said he was. He's the Messiah. He told us that he was going to die a horrible death and that three days later he would rise. And in the courtyard of my despair, I doubted. But I can see now that he really is who he said he was. And then the Bible teaches that after Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room, and that included Peter. After that happened, Peter had a serious identity crisis. You see, Jesus may be who he said he was. He did exactly what he said he would do, that he would rise from the grave. And he may be who he said he was, but I am definitely not who he said I am. And as a result of that identity crisis, he went back 
to his old way of life. You ever failed God and then was tempted to go back to who you were in spite of who God says you are? In John 21, chapter, or chapter 21, verse 3, the Bible tells us that Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Peter had given up on the idea that he could ever be who Jesus said he was. And I think that the leadership that Jesus saw in him and his strength was not only leading himself away from God's purpose, it was also leading others to abandon their identity in Jesus as well. The Bible says that all went with him. That means all of the other disciples who had also fallen, they all went with him. But you know what the good news is for Peter and for all of us? Jesus wasn't interested in leaving Peter to all of his self-condemnation. He had a purpose and a plan to fulfill, and Peter's life was to be a big part of that plan and that purpose. Jesus plans. He plans a life-changing event to restore Peter's identity long before Peter failed. I want to show you the results of Jesus' plan and then how the life-changing event in our lives always provide us with opportunities to be made right with God. In other words, God sees in advance all the mistakes you're going to make, and He has no plan of leaving you there without giving you the opportunity to do something about it. So let's take a look at the results first. In John chapter 21, beginning with verse 4, the Bible says at dawn, this is after Jesus was rose, after he, he met them in the upper room. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right side, right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple, Jesus loved, said to Peter, not to everybody else, notice how God purposely and intentionally does this. This disciple says to Peter, who happens to be their leader, who happens to be the one who led them back to their old way of life, he says to Peter, it's the Lord. And I don't know if he shouted that, or if he just kind of whispered it, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to the shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for there were about a hundred and hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were about 153 large fish, and yet the net had not torn. Now come and have some breakfast. Jesus said none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them bread and fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. Let me ask you something. Have you ever had one of those meals where it's just a little bit awkward? I mean, because you and your friends or your family is sitting there and there's this huge elephant in the room, everyone knows there's a thing. But no one really is talking about it. In fact, the scripture seems to imply that they ate the whole breakfast without talking about the thing. You can imagine the tension has got to be deep. And then sure enough, when they finish eating, Jesus himself breaks the silence. And he's not talking to anybody else but Peter. Peter. And he asked Peter three consecutive times if he loves him. John 21, beginning with verse 15. 
After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. You know every time Peter said, you know, then what he's doing is identifying, Jesus, you really are who you say you are. You know all things. You know that I love you. And feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Jesus said a third time, or Jesus asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time, and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Verse 17 says that by the third time, Peter felt hurt by Jesus asking him the same question three times. But how many times was Peter asked if he knew Jesus? Three. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three. Jesus, full of grace, full of mercy, wasn't trying to hurt Peter with his three questions. He was trying to heal him. There are all types of fires in the Bible, but there were only two that I'm aware of that were actually and distinctively called charcoal fires. One was the fire around which Peter himself denied Jesus. In John 18, 18, the Bible says, Because it was cold, the household servant, servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. The other was the fire that Jesus made on the shore that morning when he redeemed Peter. In John 21, 9, it says this, when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. You ever done something that was wrong? And every time you're in a certain place, every time you see a picture of something or maybe even a smell of a certain fragrance, and you're suddenly reminded of your past failure. Well, I think we all have those triggers somewhere in the recesses of our mind, and most of them still greatly influence our identity, and oftentimes hinder us from believing that we really are who He says we are. Well, Jesus wasn't going to let this be a problem for Peter. I think this could be the very reason that Jesus resets this scene of Peter's denial. It's in this place that he chooses to restore him. Think about this. What could have forever been a reminder of Peter's greatest failure was reclaimed right then and there by the grace of God. And from then on, every time Peter would stand around a fire, and that would probably have been something that was daily, Every time he would stand around a charcoal fire, it would have been a reminder of the shame of his past. But rather than a reminder of the shame of his past, God allows it to be a reminder of his grace in Peter's life. Stay with me on this. Because of God's grace in Peter's life, that daily, that daily fire that would have been something that he would have been warmed by, fed from, and even shared fellowship with others around, would not be a fire that constantly reminded him of who he was. But instead, it would be a fire that would remind him of who he is. And what is that? He is forgiven. He is loved. And he is restored. And every time he's sitting around that fire, he's reminded of what God had done in his life. 
And in spite of where he came from, in spite of who he was, this fire now in Peter's life represents who he is. When you read this story, you'll notice that Jesus never one time mentions Peter denying him. Not one time. He never even brings it up. You need to understand this. Jesus doesn't point in condemnation to our past. Instead, He points with compassion to our future. John 3.17 says, God sent His Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. So I have a question for those who may feel disqualified. Who disqualified you? Who took you out of the game and put you on the bench? Was it Jesus or was it somebody else? Listen, the voices of guilt and shame will whisper in your mind and make you feel like your calling has been sidelined. Your negative thoughts will say to you, they're never going to listen to you again. You never are going to have any real authority. No one's ever going to trust you. And every one of those thoughts are dead wrong. You can have the same kind of life-changing event that Peter had with Jesus. You know what you need? There's only one thing. The only thing you need, the only thing you have to do is accept His invitation to breakfast. Just have some breakfast with Him. In Revelation 3, 20 and 21, Jesus says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door... I will come in and listen to what he says. I will share a meal with you together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Listen, believe it or not, Jesus has got your back. He's fighting for you. It was David himself who said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not just the good days or the days that I get it all right and make no mistakes. Every single day, goodness and mercy are following me around. So it's time to break free from whatever's holding you back and get busy. Get back to what God has called you to do. Start believing that you are who He says you are. God's mercy is made new every morning. That's the glorious result of God's plan to restore Peter. And it can be yours as well. Now I want to take a look real quick at what led up to this kind of encounter with Jesus and how He tried to prepare Peter for it and more importantly, what we can learn from this life-changing event in Peter's life. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus is warning Peter. He's trying to tell him that he's going to find himself right in the middle of a huge identity crisis. In other words, Jesus is telling Peter that the world he's living in is about to be terribly rocked. Has anybody had their world rocked this week? Something just seemed to pop out of nowhere and challenge who Jesus says you are? Or challenge who Jesus says He is? Well, listen to what Jesus tells Peter is about to happen to him. In Luke 22, 31 and following, Simon, Simon, over here. Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you. Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, sounds like, an, sounds like an absolute there to me, doesn't it you? When you've repented, he's not saying if, he's saying when, you've repented and turned to me again, you have a job, you have a responsibility. And let me tell you what it is. Strengthen your brothers. Now, can you imagine, Peter, what do you mean you've prayed that my faith won't fail? What do you mean when I repent? 
In verse 33, Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you, even to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even knew me. Peter has no idea that life as he knows it is about to change. Let me tell you something about the life-changing events in our lives. They always provide us with opportunities, every single one of them. So whatever you're going through, it may be horrifying. It may be wrecking everything in you. It may be wrecking your faith. It may be wrecking your thoughts. But every opportunity or every life-changing event gives us an opportunity to encounter God. Opportunities like number one, discovering who we really are when we're squeezed. Peter thought he was something he wasn't, didn't he? Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. He never saw himself as one who could ever be overtaken by fear. He thought that he was more of a man of loyalty and commitment than he actually was. What do you suppose we can learn about ourselves through the life-changing events of, say, for example, death? The life-changing events of maybe sickness, divorce, personal failure, or how about even our successes? What about you or what about your families? Have you ever had a life-changing event that unexpectedly occurred? An event that really shook you? I mean, what did you discover about yourself? What did you discover about your family? Did it expose your weaknesses? Did it unite you or did it divide you with somebody? Did it reveal your need for God or did it cause you to doubt Him and His abilities? Listen, most of the life-changing events in my life start right there. God, I thought you were. God, I thought this. And it always leads to the same conclusion. God, I doubt that you are who I thought you were. And I have to come full circle with my faith to realize he is exactly who he said he was. But in that moment of that life-changing event, it always forces me to go there first. Peter didn't really know who he was until he was squeezed. What about you? When life squeezes you, what comes out? I mean, I know what we, we all know what should, but what does? Because the truth is, what's in the well really does come up in the bucket. You said, before that life-changing event ever occurred, you said, remember, that Jesus is my deliverer. And then, boom, that life-changing event comes along. And when you needed to be delivered, you look somewhere else other than Jesus for deliverance. You said that you believe that you are who, who, who you, are, you are, Jesus, who you say you are, until you're reminded. Until you're reminded that your sin has separated you from God. And then suddenly you doubt. You said, many of you, you know how I know this? Because go out in the foyer, to my right, your left, and there's three boards over there. And on those three boards, many of you have written down, I am who Jesus says I am, and then you wrote something down on that board. So you said, I am who you say I am, until that life-changing event occurs, and then suddenly you doubt if you really are who he says you are. Life-changing events gives us the opportunity to find out who we really are, but they also give us the opportunity, number two, to learn from our failures and become a strength for others to draw from. Jesus told Peter, after you've fallen, when you've repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. You know, no matter how hard you try, you're just never going to get fully prepared for everything this life's going to throw at you. So you know what that means? That means, if you're like me, that means that your first response to any life-changing event is probably not going to be your best one. 
And that means that when that life-changing event occurs, there's a real good chance that you're going to make a mistake or fail. The question is, can you learn from those mistakes? And can you use those experiences to help others? This same command that Jesus gave to Peter, strengthen your brothers, is also for us. Jesus is telling Peter, listen, when you make your way through the sifter and Satan has done his worst, trust me when I tell you, you're going to come out on top. In other words, Peter, your faith is going to be tested. It's going to be tried. And it's going to be found to be weak. Your identity is going to be challenged. You're going to question who you really are. But nevertheless, Peter, you're going to make it. You're going to be okay. Not because of your own power or your own ability, but because Jesus, listen to me, has pleaded in prayer for you. And Satan cannot go any further than Jesus allows him to. Jesus told Peter, after you come through this life-changing event, go and strengthen your brothers, because many of them, many of your brothers, aren't nearly as strong as you are. Their faith is going to be even weaker than yours. They're going to be running in fear, denying that they even know me. My death on the cross is going to so cause their hearts to be filled with doubt. They're going to need you. So Peter, make the best of this opportunity before you. Learn from your failure. Jesus is saying, Peter, let me restore your faith in me. And then let me reestablish your true identity. You're the rock, remember? Let me reestablish your true identity and become a strength for others to draw from. It's so easy to get focused on ourselves, our pain and our problems, that we become oblivious to the people around us. But real life changing events provide us with all kinds of opportunities, folks. This next opportunity is probably one that I'm sure we would all like to avoid. But every single life-changing event that we will ever experience will provide us an opportunity, number three, to be sifted. Anybody want to sign up for that? Jesus' warning to Peter is the same for us. You hear what I'm telling you? Satan wants to sift you. He's trying to destroy all that you are. He's trying to break your spirit. He's trying to destroy your family and rob you of your faith in God. You know, Satan would love to destroy this church. He really would. Because you guys are some powerful people. You guys are some strong people. And you've gone through the sifter. You've gone through some of the worst. I know many of you. You've gone through some of the worst life-changing experience imaginable. And you've come out the other side having learned from those experiences, and you're standing strong, ready to help somebody else. So Satan would love to tear you down. He would love to destroy this church. He's trying to get you to change your mind right now. To change your direction. He wants you to go back to your old ways. He wants you to leave this way, get off this path. He wants you to stop allowing yourself to be confronted by the Holy One of Israel. He wants you to come home where it's safe, comfortable, and convenient. You hear what I'm telling you? You understand that every time there is a problem with your kids, Satan is sifting you? Every time you can't pay a bill, even though you work hard and you're financially responsible, Satan is sifting you. Every time you have a temptation to do wrong, Satan is sifting you. Every time you're angry, I don't care what the reason is, Satan is sifting you. And every time you want to give up, Satan is sifting. Every time your faith is put to the test, your calling is challenged. Your obedience is demanded, or your character, your identity is questioned. 
Satan is sifting. Folks, the sifting process never stops, and it's always uncomfortable. It's never, it's never. Listen, I need to get a witness out of this when I tell you this. It's never going to feel good to find out that there is still some impatience in us. Listen, I don't like to know that there's still some lumpy unforgiveness in me that, 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 that still needs to be sifted. Or that I have lumpy, weak faith in God at times that still needs to be sifted. But the truth is, there is still some sifting needed to be done in me. And I don't like it. But it is so necessary. Aren't you glad this morning that Jesus is on your side in the battle for your soul? I mean, Satan tries to sift and destroy us. But you understand that he can never accomplish his mission because greater is he who is in me. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Where do you see God at work in your life? Where do you see him work in these life-changing events? Because, folks, until we leave this world, we're going to experience many of them. It can be as simple as your health. It could be your relationship with somebody, your family, or a job. No matter what it is, we have got to discover some things about ourselves that we didn't know. We've got to really believe that we are who He says we are in spite of all the other voices. We've got to learn from our mistakes. and We've got to allow Christ to restore our faith and our true identity. And we've got to become a strength for others to draw from. We've got to be honest with ourselves and understand that there is going to be some sifting in our lives. And folks, we've got to look to see where God is at work. You can't overcome Satan on your own. But through the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of the Lamb, you can. And you'll overcome. The fact is, your victory over sifting, over this whole sifting process, listen, that will become a very significant part of your testimony. And I can promise you, you're going to be much stronger for having gone through that process, and in the end, you're going to be able to help your brothers and sisters. Especially as they face the very same kind of sifting process in their lives to build their faith. You're going to be the ones that come along and say, listen, I know it's tough. I've been there. But if you'll trust God, and you'll believe that He really is who He says He is, and you'll believe that you really are who He says you are. When you get through this process, you're going to be so much stronger, so much better, so much healthier, and so much wiser. Every life-changing event you'll ever face has the ability to suck the life right out of you. All of us are being sifted. But you know what I know for sure? Not all of us at the same time. So those of you who are being sifted right now, you need to allow those who have already been through the process to strengthen you, to help you keep your faith in Jesus. As I close this morning, let me ask you, through your life-changing events, have you discovered just how vulnerable you really are? How easy it is to doubt who Jesus says He is, even more doubt who He says you are? Remember Peter? I told you how strong he was. He was the very leader that Jesus chose. He was so strong. He was the kind you can just turn loose. And man, he, he just does an amazing job. But his strength became a weakness because he didn't see the sifting process as something he needed in his life. In fact, what did he say to Jesus? I don't care what everybody else does. I'm never leaving you. I'm never going to deny you. I'm never going to be that guy. I'll die with you. And then he started getting sifted. Every life-changing event will give you an opportunity to discover who you really are when you're squeezed. Learn from our failures and become a strength for others to draw from. To be sifted and to see where God is at work is a process we're going through whether we like it or not. To all of those 
who have given up on the idea of ever being any more than you are right now. This morning, your faith is wrecked. Your identity is wrecked. You're not sure who to believe in or who you really are. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart right now, and He says to you, if you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal together as friends. During our time of invitation, would you come and seize the opportunities afforded to you this morning? Come and have lunch with Jesus. Come and claim God's promises to renew your strength, your faith, and your true identity. Would you stand with me this morning as we pray? I'm going to ask our counselors to come. And as they make their way down, some of you have gone through the sifting process and, and you are so raw, so vulnerable right now. You don't know what to believe, who to believe in. You don't know what to believe about yourself. But right now, God wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to have a meal with you. He has prepared a place for you to come and meet with Him that He might restore you. As God gives you this opportunity today during our time of invitation, would you come? God in heaven, I ask you right now for those that are here that have been bruised, beaten, and battered. God, those that have had their faith shipwrecked. Those that have had life-changing events and they're not sure how to believe in you right now. They're not sure what they believe about themselves right now. God, would you ever so lovingly with the grace that you've provided to us through the cross, would you draw those people to you, restore and reclaim for them their identity that they have forsaken, that they have given up, that they've abandoned. Restore them just like you did Peter. If you'll trust God today, he's not going to look over your shoulder and point to what you've done. He's going to look in front of you and cast your eyes upon a future that He has for you. A promise to bless you, to use you, to restore you, and to be in a right, loving relationship with Him. Who does Jesus say you are? Before you leave, step out into the foyer, to my right, to your left. And you're going to see some canvases. Go write down who God says you are. But as God gives you this opportunity while our counselors are here, come and just simply pour your heart out to God as He gives you this moment. Would you come? Father, we thank you for this message that we've heard today and a reminder of who we are in you. A reminder of who you are and why being in you is so, so important. I pray that as we go out, whatever we're dealing with, whatever doubts or um, a lack of faith or whatever it is, God, that we would keep our focus on you and that the truth of who you are doesn't change. And the truth of who we are in you doesn't change either. And so as we're going through these hard times, we would remember your promise that you say you'll never leave us or forsake us. And we can put all of our trust in that, not necessarily on how we're feeling. And it's all in your son, Jesus Christ's name, and we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.